Okay, so it's just hitting the one o'clock hour. I'm super excited to get this conversation going. And for some reason that surpasses all understanding, Matt has allowed me to do the moderation of this particular video. Um, so thank you, Matt, for getting us all set up. And thank you, Natalia, for joining us today. I've got just a couple of announcements before we get going here for the talk. Um, first of all, if you're still joining us, feel free to say hi in the chat and let everybody know who's here and where you're from so we can see kind of the fullness of the people gathered with us today. That'll also help us, I think, too, to tailor our responses in the question and answer portion of uh, the webinar. So uh, thank you for doing so in the chat. While we're listening to the lecture portion of the webinar, feel free to keep your questions and your comments going in the chat, but it'll help us, I think, to um, keep track of those questions. If you, again, look at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A function. If you click on that, a little box will pop open that says Q&A, and you can type in your questions there. You might get a response to those questions um, typed out while we're listening. Otherwise, um, I'll do my best to keep track of those questions and I will pitch them to Natalia at the end of her lecture so that we can hear her responses to them and, and engage in a bit of a, a dialogue as much as possible. Um, uh, just so that uh, we're um, putting this in a co context a little bit, I wanted to make sure that you also know that Every day for the rest of this week and for the next couple of weeks, we've got a different webinar on a different topic. We're hoping that we can use this time, this summertime, um, to kind of expand our minds, use it like a summer school, use it as a way to stay connected, even though we can't be physically present for one another, um, to keep learning, keep growing, and um, keep trying to um, better answer our call to um, our vocation. Um, so check out all the webinars on the GIA Facebook page. They're all free, which I'm also really excited about because I know things are tough right now and uh, that doesn't mean that we don't still have stuff to learn. So these are all free opportunities to keep our minds sharp and keep us thinking about stuff that's important right now. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump in here. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm so thankful that you're with us, Natalia. This is a really hard time. Uh, for uh, a lot of us for so many reasons. And one of those particular stresses we're feeling in the music ministry community is um, a real failure to protect people. And I know that it's, um, it's easy and I, I do it too to fall into a despair about that. Um, but I'm trying to keep mindful of something that uh, my spiritual director and uh, therapist encourage me to do when something is really, um, really upsetting to get really curious about it. And so I'm glad that we have you here today um, to kind of spark or um, maybe even answer some of those curiosities about ways that we can be more attentive to what led us to this place and um, how we can maybe rethink about, you know, being better, getting somewhere better. So um, introduce yourself if you don't mind really quick, and then I'm going to jump off uh, the, the screen and let you take off for your lecture. But this Dr. Natalia Imperatory Lee, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Kate. And thanks to Matt. Thanks to everyone at GIA. Um, I'm really honored to be here in this space with you all and be able to chat about something I'm really passionate about. Um, I am a professor of religious studies at Manhattan College, which is a small Lasallian liberal arts college in New York, in the Bronx. And I direct the Catholic Studies program there, and I'm also affiliated with the Lasallian Women and Gender Resources Center there. Um, shout out to one of our participants, Alana Boyle, who is a former student of mine whose activism got that program off the ground. Um, so we pride ourselves in creating um, student activists. And that's one of our sources of pride and joy. So I'm just gonna hop right in here. This is a lecture about um, the Me Too movement and how that expresses itself in the church. Um, my remarks today, you know, this is a subject that is contentious and it is sensitive. It provokes a lot of very strong feelings from people uh, from all walks of life. And so I wanna just at the outset be very clear about where we're going with this. I am gonna talk about assault and I'm gonna talk about abuse. And if these are difficult topics for you personally, I definitely want you to be aware of this and feel free to step away or mute or do what you need to do to take care of yourself. 
I'm also, as Kate mentioned in her uh, commercial for this, going to be talking about unapologetic feminism. And if that's difficult for you personally, then I invite you to stick around. Um, feminism has for many years become kind of a dirty word. And it's a word that isn't really, for some people, compatible with Christianity and least of all with Roman Catholicism. But really, feminism is just the belief that women are human beings made in the image of God. I personally approach feminism from an intersectional lens. That's another word that gets a lot of uh, flack these days. It's become a little scary. But all that means is that I acknowledge in my analysis of events, world events, assaults, things like this, that racism, sexism, and classism, and colonialism are all interconnected, and they can intensify one another. Right? As a light-skinned, um, some people call it white passing, but as a light-skinned Latina, uh, I reap the benefits of racial injustice, even as I'm marginalized because of my sex and my ethnicity. I hope that this all becomes obvious in my talk, but at the same time, we don't really have the luxury of quarreling over words. I don't know if you've realized that we're kind of living through an apocalyptic time, personally, communally, nationally, and globally. So in light of everything we know, we're really low on time, right? Especially everything we know about rampant abuse and harassment of children, of women, and of other vulnerable persons in our church and in our country. So I'm gonna cut right to the chase here. A few weeks ago, three women came forward in NCR with details of how David Haas manipulated them and abused them spiritually and sexually. He ran a camp for teenagers. He had particular special friendships with teens who caught his eye and he memorized their 18th birthdays. That was the detail that stuck with me. In the intervailing weeks, many, many other survivors have come forward and have provoked a variety of responses from different communities. Earlier this year, in a horrifying report commissioned by the L'Arche community, we learned that its founder, Jean Vanier, a hero to so many and someone who was hailed as a living saint for his work with adults who have mental disabilities, abused his power and preyed on women who came to him for spiritual direction, likening it to a Jesus and Mary situation. And this is the thing, right? Sooner or later, this news will come to light about someone you admired, regardless of your ideological slant. That may have been in the past few weeks for you. The founder of the Legionnaires of Christ, Marcial Maciel, was an absolute monster who abused young boys and seminarians. He also fathered six children with four women, some of whom he went on to abuse as well. He was a rapist, a morphine addict who got seminarians and others in his circle addicted and he was also hailed as an important fundraiser and benefactor of the Roman Catholic Church. And he enjoyed the protection of this Pope John Paul II for far too long. Pope Benedict removed Maciel, sentenced him to a life of penance and silence, and put the legionnaires under new direction. But an abusive culture persists in that group, with allegations of abuse and cover-ups, priests sent to ask abuse victims to lie and settle for a cash payout, people fathering children out of wedlock and keeping them hidden, things like this remain. And we know that these are only the most visible stories, but the singular stories that make headlines like this shouldn't obscure for us the banality and the ubiquity, the everydayness of sex abuse in our church. The Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report named more than 300 priest abusers and several bishop enablers only a couple of years ago. The lists coming from dioceses, from religious orders, and now even lay organizations like L'Arche or allegations from publishing houses like GIA make this abuse crisis seemingly endless. So why do we bring them up? I think Kate was right on here. The first step in learning from movements like Me Too and Church Too is to look at abusive culture straight on. Right? If we look away because we're squeamish, or we don't want that kind of negativity, or we choose to focus on the positive, we're effectively turning our backs on the suffering of vulnerable people around us. And let's not make a mistake. In cultures that use authority and secrecy as currency, all of us are potentially vulnerable people. So let's set out some terms, right? I'm talking about sexual abuse, sexual assault, and sexual harassment. These are not all the same thing, although they flourish in similar cultures. In fact, 
some cultures are particularly receptive hosts to sexual misconduct that can vary from hostile work environments to child rape. Sexual assault is defined as sexual contact that occurs without the explicit consent of the victim. 80% of these are committed by someone known to the victim. Sometimes we can couch this in euphemisms like non-consensual sex. The word for that in English is rape. Sexual abuse of children refers to any kind of sexual contact with a child since children cannot consent to sexual activity of any kind. Sexual harassment encompasses a variety of behaviors that range from unwanted sexual advances to the creation of a hostile work environment through lewd or targeting comments, all the way to rape or assault in the workplace. They're not all the same crime. They don't all carry the same punishments. What they have in common is the likelihood that perpetrators will get away with it. It's that simple. It is notoriously difficult to get victims to come forward, in large part because our justice system is not hospitable to survivors of sexual violence. We live in a culture of rape. And I used to think that that was just a hyperbolic, sensationalized way of talking, kind of like a snap or like a bullhorn to get people's attention. But really, rape culture is the assumption, and I think we were all raised with it to some extent, I know I was to a large extent, that given the opportunity, men will assault women sexually. I remember watching Back to the Future with my sons, and there's a scene in which the bully, um, I forget everybody's name, but whatever, the bully kind of corners the woman who will grow up to be uh, Michael J. Fox's mom. And the assumption is that if he gets her alone, he will definitely rape her. There's no sort of question about it. This idea that men have uncontrollable drives and women have to take steps to prevent harm to themselves, that's rape culture. That we assume that, well, this is just how men are, or this is the way that the world is, that the world sort of leans or tends toward rape. So we are responsible for putting guardrails in place, like carrying mace, or learning self-defense, or not jogging at night, or not jogging with headphones. Because to make yourself vulnerable is to invite the inevitable. That inevitability, that is the normalization of assault, right? That creates a culture of rape. So let's talk about responses to this kind of culture. Activist Tarana Burke coined the phrase Me Too in 2006 to bring attention to the pervasiveness of sexual harassment that women face in the workplace and in the world at large. The phrase became part of our national lexicon in 2017 when it was trending on Twitter, haha, <laughs> accompanying women's stories of sexual harassment and assault. It grew like a tsunami of horror. Harvey Weinstein, Matt Lauer, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Juno Diaz, Tavis Smiley, Charlie Rose, Charlie Rose! I mean, isn't PBS supposed to be like this bastion of culture? Like I remember growing up in Miami, I was, you know, the child of Cuban immigrants. And I always thought that it was the height of Americanness to get your news from PBS, right? We, we watch things like Univision and listen to Cuban talk radio, like, but the real Americans, they watch Charlie Rose. But it turns out, guess what? Charlie Rose is a grotesque predator too. And like the Catholic cases that I referenced above, those are just the headline grabbers, right? The real headline is all the women who raise their hands in recognition. Oh yeah, of course. I've had employers make sexual comments or touch me inappropriately or strangers holler at me on the street. Oh, sure, yeah. Someone in a position of power over me has made comments about my body or about my intimate life. I remember being struck when I read a lot of these stories about the number of men who disrobe in their offices during the work day. I thought, my God, I didn't realize how common it was for people to drop their pants at work. Who knew we needed to kind of put rules in about this? How can people not know that this is appalling sort of beyond the pale behavior? Women have been here before. In the consciousness raising groups of the 1960s and 70s, women were seeing their experiences of invisibility and harassment played out by their friends and neighbors. Early feminists of this period referred to the sense of recognizing your own experiences in the shared narrative of someone else as a feminist clique, right? I heard this term from Jewish theologian Judith Plaskow, who also refers to it as a yeah, yeah moment of meetings of women graduate students at Yale. That feeling of hearing someone complain about something that you thought was just part of your life, 
like getting referred to as sugar or asked to, being asked to refill the coffee or being passed over for a promotion because you were just going to have kids anyway. Being invisible at work, doing a double shift right at home after you came home from working all day. Yeah, yeah, that happens to me too. Yeah, I also feel that way. Hear the yeah, yeah. In these gatherings, something clicks for women. It's the click that breaks through isolation and into solidarity. Oh, so it wasn't just me. I didn't bring this on myself because I'm not assertive enough. Give off some kind of a vibe. This person does the same things to my coworkers. Once I realize that, I don't have an isolated problem. I have solidarity with those who share my problem, right? And we together have a movement. This consciousness raising that gave rise to second wave feminism helped white middle and upper class women secure important wins, like the holding of money in bank accounts in their own names, the normalization of working outside the home for white women, some recognition of the labor involved in caring for children and families and households. But that second wave movement left many women behind. Writer and activist uh, Sarah Ahmed refers to a different kind of feminist sound, right? She's, she talks not about a click, but about a snap, like a branch on a tree, she says. Women who are derided, harassed, raped, silenced, and disbelieved eventually get to a point where they snap. The snap is loud, and women who snap raise a stink. They demand to be noticed. They demand justice. But more often than not, especially in the case of women of color who suffer marginalization, remember intersectionality, on the basis of sex and race and class, those women tend to be viewed as problematic, as prima donnas, as demanding troublemakers who are difficult. Why is that? In part, it's because we hear the snap, but we never consider the pressure, the indignity, the harassment that bends and bends and bends that branch until it can no longer bear the weight. We should think very seriously about how often our cultures focus on the snap as being violent and not on all the abuse that bent and bent and bent that branch as a pre-existing or first violence, right? This is what Gustavo Gutierrez refers to it when he says that poverty is a first violence. So some women click and some women yeah, yeah, and some women snap, and now many of us have said me too. The common ground to all of these sounds is the emergence after the initial light bulb moment of solidarity of the unifying power of experience that prompts us to work for justice. The unifying power of experience that prompts us to work for justice is not a terrible definition of the church, if you think about it. The same year Me Too was trending, a Nashville-based poet, Emily Joy, added her own hashtag to the mix, church Too. Joy wanted to bring attention to how Protestant pastors, evangelical pastors in her specific case, groomed young people for assault through youth programs and things like this. And this may sound familiar to the crowd gathered here. Her hashtag and the wave of reaction to it revealed how predators select and prepare victims through seemingly innocuous channels like youth groups or mentoring or music ministry camps. Even theologian Emily Reimer Berry has surmised that the way we catechize children with an emphasis on obedience to authority and the secrecy of the confessional, along with the attendant shame about sin might lay the groundwork for abuse. God, even catechism, right? Everything seems so broken. The problem seems so deep seated in our institutions and in our, our culture that we can start to feel really hopeless. What's more, it seems that the tendency towards sexual assault is not confined to the Catholic Church or the business world, both of which tend to be organized hierarchically, since abuse flourishes in church communities that are organized presbyterally or conciliarly or charismatically. Abuse and harassment flourish in the Hebrew schools and in the Boy Scouts at PBS and NBC, in urban and in rural areas. Predators exist and they seek access to children and other targets. It is one of the most terrifying things about parenthood. And what those of you who are parents must feel this like I feel it, right? Predators don't look creepy, which is one of the reasons why predators are successful. So let's turn our attention now to three other factors that contribute to abuse tolerant and abuse enabling cultures and what we might do in terms of next steps. Many of my students and my family and my peers 
wish we could just move on from this constant talk of sexual abuse and harassment and assault. Moving on can sometimes mean walking away or changing the channel. And it's so tempting to do this, especially now, right? We're exhausted. We're at the end of our rope, especially in, in these pandemic times. We've been cooped up, right? I've got three adult-sized males live here. Trust me, I know. I'd love to move on. But if we want to move on as followers of Christ, we have to not look away from suffering or change the channel so that we can watch something else. Moving on for the church involves at least three confrontations. A confrontation with misogyny, a confrontation with secrecy, and one with shame. In other words, we have to have serious conversations about sexism, clericalism, but really elitism, and sexuality in the church and beyond it. Only by moving through this desert can we emerge to the other side transformed. So first, let's confront misogyny. Misogyny is not a word I heard a lot growing up, and it sounds, and sounded to me at least, extreme or implausible, right? When you look it up, it says hatred of women, and who can pinpoint that on a person, right? Everybody likes their mom, or their sister, or their wife, their daughter. We hear misogyny a lot more frequently now, but I fear it could get confused with regular old sexism or just discrimination. So philosopher Kate Mann, who wrote this amazing book that I'm going to refer called Down Girl. It's a magisterial book on misogyny. In, it, in here, she reorients our understanding of misogyny away from feelings, right, like hatred, hatred of women, which is something that you cannot quantify, right? How do you know if you feel hatred or just severe dislike or like, you know, antipathy? And secondly, it's located in the person doing the hating, and therefore we depend on people's self-reporting and self-awareness to for misogyny to exist, right? If misogyny is hatred of women, then the, the hater, if you will, has to say, no, no, that's true, I do hate women. But that puts a lot of onus on someone who is the perpetrator of violence and takes away all agency from the victims of violence. So for man, and here I'm quoting, misogyny should be understood as the law enforcement branch of a patriarchal order which has the overall function of policing and enforcing its governing ideology. In other words, it's not something psychological in the person who may or may not hate women, but rather an action, a thing done, a punishment felt. Not all women feel the punishment, because after all, the police only interfere when a woman gets out of line. So what is the line that we're held to in patriarchy? For man, Kate now. Women are expected to be, and here's her quote, men's loving, attentive subordinates. Does that sound familiar to any of us gathered here? What do you think of when you think of a good woman, or better question, who do you think Catholics are supposed to think of when they think of a good woman? I hope that chat is filling up with the word Mary, right? Or maybe it's a saint, right? Few of whom are women even few of whom are women who were ever married, and fewest of whom are women who were sexually active throughout their lives. Women who aren't good are categorized as bad. Badness for a woman can mean a number of things, but overall, these offenses are classed as violations of the standard of goodness, right? Not virginal enough, not deferential enough, not nurturing enough. Good womanhood has been presented to Catholic women almost entirely wrapped up in suffering. Here are just scenes from Mary's life, right? The Mater Dolorosa of the Pietà, the mother who frets for her son's sanity as she's beginning, he's beginning his um, ministry, the mother who gives birth silently in a barn or a cave or whatever, the mother who frets about her child lost in the temple. Almost every visual we have of Mary is Mary suffering somehow. Of course, the relationship between Mary and, equal is Mary and Jesus is fundamentally unequal. He is fully divine and human, and she is merely human, even though she's conceived without original sin. That that relationship becomes a template for all male-female relationships is the problematic through line in Catholic theology with which we have to contend. The history of subjugating women in Christianity isn't a mere accident. And it's not really all that temporary, and it's not something that we can just brush away or turn the page on. 
While some scholars have made compelling cases for why Jesus was atypical in his treatment of women, right? He accepted it, them as disciples equally. He did not condemn women in adultery situations, which were more often than not rape situations. The same cannot be said of Jesus' followers. The sexism in our church runs very deep. So I'll just give you some greatest hits. Tertullian taught that each woman was another Eve, the devil's gateway through whom sin entered the world and because of whom the Son of God had to die. That's you, ladies. Augustine thought, taught that women were in the image of, that men were in the image of God, but women were not, because women are aligned with the body and men with the spirit. Women were only in the image of God for Augustine when taken together with a man. Aquinas, who I know we all want to love, taught that women were defective males. This is only one trifecta of many, many ways in which the Christian tradition communicates women's inferiority and justifies our subjugation. Most recently, we see this in the complementarian theology that comes from the Vatican since the pontificate of John Paul II. Yeah, Lori, defective males. So the theology of the body just compounds this, right? Complementarity is the belief that men and women are two halves of a whole, which sounds so nice, but think about Augustine, right? And that the gifts of each complement the other. It sounds so beautiful and really romantic, like a lovely part of God's design. After all, it's based in the genital complementarity of men and women. Not to deny biological complementarity, but Let's ask ourselves if biological complementarity necessarily implies psychological complementarity. What about social complementarity? Academic, employment complementarity. One crucial flaw in complementarian thinking is that it takes biological assumptions about sexual intercourse, namely that it is always done one way, and turns that into an entire social order where men are initiatory and aggressive and women are receptive and nurturing. If you heard an echo of rape culture there, you're listening really closely. So we get women's special nature and vocation to motherhood, spiritual motherhood or otherwise. We have no similar documentation of men's nature or men's vocation, either because it is assumed or left wide open with possibility. Hmm. Receptive and nurturing. Where have I heard that before? Women are to be men's attentive, loving subordinates, said Kate Matt. Keep in mind that misogyny assigns women crucial roles, right? We're necessary for the propagation of the species after all. And indeed, that is very special, right? I've been pregnant several times. I have two beautiful children. But being made to feel special is not the same thing as being given freedom of self-determination. As I tell my students a lot, a pedestal is a prison. Sometimes when I read the pains that papal documents or Vatican documents go to to emphasize the special necessary nature of women's voices, the need to protect women from clericalization or from the messiness of work outside the home or the messiness of politics, I want to scream. That is a template for misogyny, a how-to for how to become an attentive and loving servant. And honestly, have any of you ever lived through norovirus with children? We don't need to be protected from me messiness, right? least of all mothers. We've never gotten any protection from messiness. We're mired in it, which is what the complementarian thinking doesn't allow. In this vision of perfect complementarity between husband and wife, between Christ and the church, the perfection glosses over the reality, which is, that two-parent households where the mom stays home to take care of the kids has always been the province of the white middle class and has been used as a cudgel to talk about the irresponsibility of non-white parents, for example. Complementarian theology is problematic because it relies on and perpetuates stereotypes, a template for misogynistic thinking by setting the parameters against which women will be judged, and maybe most damningly because it just isn't real. Real mothers cannot be nurturing all the time without depleting themselves. Am I right, moms in the audience? Real life is messy and ambiguous 
and there are bills and layoffs and sometimes women get very angry and very aggressive and believe it or not church sometimes women even initiate sex just as we have to confront how deep the roots of misogyny go in our Christian tradition and all the ways in which the church has furthered the agenda of patriarchy and domination of women, all of these which I would classify as sins of commission, we also have to look long and hard at a great sin of omission. We have reneged on our responsibility to teach young people about sexuality in productive and healthy ways. I have a ton of stories here and we can talk forever. But basically in my Sex and the Sacred class, which I teach here in New York in the Northeast, Maybe it's because they're all Northeasterners, and most of them are Irish, but most of my students were never told anything about sex from their parents. It's nothing, zero, zip, zilch. Their church painted sex almost exclusively through the lens of sin and therefore of shame. Even in the regular gen ed religion class, if you ask for an example of sin, you always get premarital sex, abortion, and homosexuality. Sometimes I think the contemporary gospel believed by most Catholics is contained in those three prohibitions. Roman Catholic teaching on sexuality remains rooted in Aristotelian notions of biology, which we get, which Aquinas imported to us, where the male is the generative principle and the female is the receptive one, as we saw in the complementarian theology, right? Our church teaches, therefore, that the only licit or allowed sexual expression occurs in the marriage bed of a heterosexual couple that does not use contraception of any kind. Out Outside of marriage, virginity or celibacy is expected and taught. In this country, this mixes in with purity culture. Oh, sorry, my hair. With purity culture, right? Which is more of an evangelical phenomenon, but still an idealized notion of sexuality. What we learned, what I learned in high school about sex is when in doubt, don't. Don't is the overarching theme. Don't be gay. Don't have sex before marriage. Don't masturbate. Don't have impure thoughts. Don't use contraception. Don't get pregnant. Don't have an abortion. Don't lose your virginity. Don't, 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 don't. Furthermore, where our notions of social morality, right, have since the 19th century been framed as principles for reflection, criteria for judgment, and guidelines for action, our sexual morality is still based on acts. They're, but what I'm saying is that rather than principles, criteria, and guidelines that assume a moral agent, an adult, capable of discernment in the complexity of a historical circumstance. Sexual teaching is still propositions from the past about procreation, for example, held up as absolute moral laws to be obeyed or disobeyed. No moral agency, no discernment, no shades of gray, if you'll pardon the best-selling pun. With our money, we're able to discern the right course of action for ourselves and our family and our world. With our genitals, we must be told what to do because our consciences stop working. And what has that brought us? Humanae Vitae came out in 1968, and more than 90% of Catholic women of childbearing age use birth control. Did it bring us more holiness, or did it just drive people underground with their sex lives? The naming of homosexuality as intrinsically disordered happened in 1975 in Persona Humanae. Did that make fewer gay people? No. It drove them to hide their identities, to leave the church, in some cases to take their families with them, and in others alienating them from the people they love, some to the point of suicide. Today, other than pre-Cana, we have very little forthright discussion of sexuality in Catholic circles, or we did until the abuse crisis happened. And that is the thing. Abuse flourishes in cultures of secrecy and shame. And our sexual teachings are entirely shame-based. We hold up Mary, a literal impossible ideal, as a perpetual virgin and also a mother for girls to imitate. And so the failure is built in. Purity culture, the way we do it in Catholicism, with our emphasis on abstinence and the sacredness of a sexuality that is not explored in any way before marriage, but should always be open to pregnancy, is toxic because purity is toxic. The Lutheran theologian and pastor Nadia Bowles Weber notes that we've confused purity with holiness, but purity is about preservation and separation from pollution, whereas holiness is about union with something, namely God. Other thinkers, like uh, Ruth Everhart, whose work I'm relying on a lot here, and here's her book, which you should totally buy. She studied the Me Too movement and the church's response to it. She noted that purity and virginity cultures are dangerous to young women in many ways. First of all, the most prized thing a woman has, her virginity, is something that can be taken from her by force without consent. 
And secondly, consent, which is a necessary part of sexual activity, is completely overlooked in cultures of purity and abstinence. Before marriage, consent is not allowed, and after marriage, consent is assumed. Everhart notes that the more conservative church cultures provide a seedbed for abuse, right? Homosexuality is taboo. Abstinence is the answer to every teenager's question about sex. Modesty is the most important and violations are virulently shamed. So all sexual activity is driven into a realm of secrecy and shame and that rolls out a red carpet for abuse. I have a section here on priests and isolation and not being sexually integrated. And I'm gonna skip it for the sake of time. But suffice it to say that in my friendship with um, people who minister to priests as psychotherapists, a lot of our cultural problems around sex in the church have to do with lack of sexual integration and just so much shame that, for instance, seminarians can't even use anatomically correct words for the body and can't talk about sexual desire in ways that are not euphemisms. And that's really problematic, right? The, the pedestal applies here too. And the toxicity of the pedestal happens everywhere in all cultures, right? In the church, in church music, in the professoriate, everywhere, right? When we elevate sexual expression like the theology of the body does, to a quasi-liturgical thing and glorify marital sexuality as if it were a mystical experience in every single instance, then what we do is traffic in shame because real life doesn't work that way. We teach our young adults that sex is to be avoided and then on their wedding night, they flip a switch and come to see sex as a defining feature of their marriage and an ultimate good. Talking about sex only through a lens of fear and shame is toxic and reducing sex to a contract where one party, usually the woman, can give or withdraw consent like a candy machine is not the answer either. What we need is a sexual ethic of concern, concern for self and other and concern for community and concern for integrity. But instead of accompanying young people who are marrying later and later through their biological sexual exploration, we leave them in the wilderness of shame and silence. That contributes to the abuse crisis and forthright conversations about sexuality way before pre cana are an important start. So I'm skipping all of this wonderful clericalism stuff. Basically, we should not put people on pedestals. We should not think about scandal in the ways that we have. If we learn nothing else from the abuse crisis and continue to learn nothing, it's that an insular entitled class of persons is not capable of self-policing. Our tendency towards self-protection and the economy of secrets, particularly sexual secrets, create a climate where truth is sacrificed again and again. If all sexual sins are horribly shameful, and you know you have yours, how likely are you to expose those of the people you work with who may know your secret? Or in a less insidious example, let's think about scandal. Our biggest problem in Roman Catholicism over the last 40 years has been a profound misunderstanding of what scandalizes the faithful. As Everhart puts it, evil resides in the actions and inactions of people who fear the wrong thing, who fear exposing evil when they should fear complicity with evil, who fear damage to reputation when they should fear damage to the vulnerable, who fear the demands of pursuing justice when they should fear the consequences of not doing so. Where some people thought if lay people found out about pedophile priests, it would be a scandal. It turns out that the actual scandal is the cover up that tries to prevent the truth from coming out. We thought that the, church would, that the church's good name would be besmirched by pedophiles, and it was, but not as much as watching the mechanisms of power circle up to protect them against the claims of the victims. We're always afraid of the wrong thing. We're afraid that the church is gonna look bad or the company is gonna look bad or our family is gonna look bad. And that fear leads to decisions that make us look so much worse. Moreover, our culture of sacrifice in the church leads to a tendency to sacrifice the truth, particularly the truth of violence against a vulnerable person. The last effect of this is something that applies broadly to many men and maybe you'll ring the bell. And that is Kate Mann's notion of hympathy, 
H-I-M-P-A-T-H-Y. Hympathy is the excessive sympathy we show perpetrators of sexual violence. Our reluctance to believe that people we know, or people just like us, or people we trust could be capable of monstrous acts. We need our monsters to look like monsters, in other words. And when they don't, when they look like people that we have been taught by or taught to respect, we are far more likely to believe, disbelieve an accusation than we are to hold one of these golden boys accountable. Hympathy is a great word for a very old phenomenon. Look at Theodore McCarrick, look at Vanier, look at Maciel. This line from Mann, Kate Mann, is devastating in its accuracy. The idea of rapists as monsters exonerates by caricature. Because these people don't look like monsters, we refuse to believe that they are. Admitting that monsters look like everyone else gets at our original point, the terrifying, heart-stopping, ubiquity, and everydayness of sexual violation that is revealed in the Me Too movement and its Church Too correlators. If you're feeling a little bit of despair right now, it's totally okay, right? It's okay to look around at the amount of abuse and cover up and sin and evil and just throw up your hands, to look at our victim outreach or our lack thereof and realize with Ruth Everhart that we have decided on a ministry to survivors that she correctly names a ministry of absence. Absence of safeguards, absence of recognition, of lament and of justice. To see how our empathy compounds the victim's pain. So what do we do? I'm low on time, so here's one suggestion, but trust me, it's a good one. Believe women. Imagine if we just believed women. I don't mean believe all women at all times, regardless of countervailing evidence. I mean, start from a position that women are trustworthy narrators of their own experience. It sounds so simple, and here is the kicker. It is biblical. When I teach feminism in scripture, my students are always struck by the reality that women couldn't testify in court, right, in halakhic law, because women's testimony counted for nothing. It was automatically discounted. Oh, we are so shocked. Oh, shocked by this. We're so much better. <laughs> the last time I taught that, Christine Blasey Ford was testifying before, the, Supreme, before uh, the panel that would decide if Kavanaugh would join the Supreme Court. We routinely disbelieve women. We talk about sexual assault, for example, in colleges where women are twice as likely to be sexually assaulted as they are to be robbed. And I'll get a student who says, oh yeah, but a lot of times girls are lying. Or the more insidious, less disbelieving, but what about due process questions? So here's the truth. Statistically, the amount of false rape reports is between two and 10%, which is about the same rate as false larceny reports or other crimes. Victims are no more likely to lie about sexual assault than they are about robbery. Some of those two to 10%, by the way, are baseless, which doesn't mean false, but rather not provably false. But fewer than four in 10 rapes at all are ever reported. There is far more violence occurring than makes it to the authorities, not that the authorities are super great when they get a report. So what would happen if we were to believe women? Why shouldn't we believe them? Is it our desire to maintain a social order? Let's look at what happened the last time a woman telling the truth upset the social order. This is a reading from Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been risen, raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. New Testament scholar Claudia Setzer, my colleague, notes that the anomaly that all four Gospels make women the first witnesses to the resurrection, right? Mary Magdalene. On her word, the male disciples run to see the empty tomb. The Gospel writers, had they wanted a stronger case, could have omitted Mary Magdalene if they wanted and just let men be the first to see the risen Christ, but they did not. 
because of the evangelist's desire to leave Mary Magdalene in the story, Christians ran a huge risk of embarrassment. After all, the central claim of Christianity, the resurrection, is predicated in all four Gospels on the previously worthless testimony of a woman. So it would seem that Christians can be people who trust a woman's experience, what she has seen and heard. Perhaps then, it's time to re recover that aspect of the tradition and become a church that believes not only women, but if we're gonna use that intersectional lens, we should work to believe all of those who are marginalized. That is how we're going to show what we have learned from Me Too. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. 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 Um, thank you. Thank you all so much. I took so many notes. Um, everyone's going, thank you, thank you, thank you. On I the see it. You're all you welcome. You don't have to thank me. <laughs> These expressions are certainly warranted and also not enough to tell you <laughs> how important this is to us. And thank you for being with us. Um, I have a lot of notes and we have a couple of questions and I invite people to keep, um, keep surfacing those questions. I want to ask if it's okay with you if we stay a little bit past the hour for those of us. I'm okay with it. If ever, you can stay or pop out, whatever you need. Okay, great. Excellent. This is such an important conversation always, but especially for us to have right now. So I'm going to um, throw a couple of these questions your way. First mm -hmm. from uh, Jenna Mountain, who will be with us um, later this week actually as another moderator. Um, and you may have included in your in too, but could you share again or maybe expand upon the origins of the church too? Hashtag church. Too. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Actually, let me um, minimize my thing here because I went to uh, full screen because I am still learning how to zoom. But it was uh, her. Last, her name is Emily Joy, and she is a. Um, yeah, I'm just going to hit Joy here. Uh, she is a Protestant, right, a Nashville-based poet. Um, you can Google her, and there was a whole sort of movement around the church to hashtag. But some people follow her on Twitter. I think I do, too. And basically, yeah, it was, it was this kind of thing that the church, the Catholic church, was having this big reckoning in the press and in the courts, because they have a centralized, more or less, hierarchy that can be prosecuted relatively easily. But the Protestant churches can be a little bit more diffuse. Um, and so there are all kinds of ministries where accountability was really sketchy, right, or spotty. And so she wanted to point especially to the role that things that seem innocuous, like youth ministry, right, which I think all of us have at some point or another had some sort of uh, experience with, <laughs> how these things can be breeding grounds for um, boundary violations and abusive behavior, and how sort of capitalizing, especially on young women and men who are emerging adults, who are figuring out their place in the world and the church, can, it's, a, it's a vulnerable time for them. And, and predators, which exist everywhere, seek out vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a lot of requests here for you to write a book on this. Thank you. Um. I want to so bad. I'm writing yeah. a textbook right now on feminist theology. And some of this stuff is in there, but it's not really, it's, it's more for undergrads taking a whole course. But I do, this is like my next big research project, I promise. Yes, yes. And uh, until then, we are going to make this um, lecture available. It'll premiere later on um, Facebook premiere, I think probably within the next day. That um, sounds really influencery. Yeah, so influencery. <laughs> um, and then, but people are asking if this transcript is available anywhere. That we is can... not, um, yeah. because I haven't published it yet. I want so to. It will be. Yes, so I, really. I'm working on it. Awesome. Um, but I did want to also bring up uh, your, um, the book that you actually have in print already called Quenta May because that too is about stories, right? And I think that you uh, talked about that too at the beginning of this lecture too, just the power of telling. Mm -hmm. um, maybe could you give us a little bit of insight into how that
that book might be just a good partner book for this conversation as well as it, it you know, standalone on its own right. Of course, yeah. Um, Cuéntame is a book that I wrote about uh, ecclesiology, right? Especially about the role of Hispanics, Caribbean Hispanics, Cubans in ecclesiology. This is it. It has a really cute cover. Um, <laughs> and what I learned in the process of writing that book that still informs me as I do this research is that the power to shape narratives is, it's a defining power, right? Whoever tells the story makes truth. And so when we listen to stories that have been sort of marginalized or silenced, we get to stand outside our received truth and see new perspectives, right? And sometimes stories are marginalized because they're lies, but sometimes stories are marginalized because they're coming from people who are not powerful. And so Cuéntame is all about sort of listening, especially to women, looking at art, looking at neglected ways of storytelling for clues about how the Holy Spirit is at work in our church and in our communities. I think that really aligns with the crucible moment that the church continues to go through and maybe that the GIA community is going through specifically because it's, it's so uncomfortable and so unsettling to face um, true stories from people who have survived sort of manipulation and abuse. And it's so tempting for us to say that it's minimal or less than important or not the whole story. But when we realize that all of our stories are partial stories, it really allows us to say, well, hang on a second. Do I not think that a person is capable of narrating their own lives and their own experience? And that's where this Mary Magdalene piece really makes a lot of sense to me, right? The church has always, the church has an investment in believing women, namely the resurrection, right? If Mary Magdalene wasn't telling the truth, right? if women are liars, was Mary Magdalene a liar? Yeah, yeah. It raises for me too that um, another interesting topic that's been accompanying, I think, what we're seeing play out in the telling of this particular story we're looking at, which is um, um, gaslighting. Mm -hmm. um, and it maybe it's um, maybe it's something that we need to learn from our ritual practice of the retelling of the story. Like we didn't just hear that story from Mary Magdalene once; we've retold it millions of times for <laughs> centuries and centuries. Um, and that work, I think, is both empowering to keep telling the stories out loud to one another and verifying, yes, that's what happened, um, but also exhausting. Yeah. And I think well, that's the point, right? The point is to exhaust you so that you'll stop. <laughs> the point is that, that you want to, it makes you want to throw in the towel, and that's the goal, right? If you want to think about biblical gaslighting, Think about uh, the way that the church made Mary Magdalene into a whore. Not a prostitute, right? Turns out there's no biblical evidence for Mary Magdalene to have been a prostitute, but all there is is a lot of artistic evidence. And once that gets locked into place, right, once we can tell that story, I don't know, I can't even tell you how many of my students argue with me that, no, 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 she was a prostitute. No, you're yeah. wrong. And I'm like, okay, just find it. Can you find the passage? And they'll say, well, she had seven demons, you know, removed from her. And I'm like, well, which one was the prostitution one? <laughs> right. So gas, I, I didn't even know what gaslighting was, I have to confess, until somebody finally explained it as the movie Gaslight. Yeah. That was the key for me. So if you don't know what it is, it's about that movie where the guy, you know, ruins the lights in the house and it drives his wife crazy from trying to assert her own reality over and over again. Yeah. Um, I think... A lot of people use gaslighting, you know, every word I feel like that survivors put out in order to gain traction in public discourse then gets sort of usurped by perpetrators <laughs> and the dominant discourse would be like, no, now you're gaslighting me. It's like, that's actually not how it works because yeah. it's a power differential, right? We're talking about power differentials. And this is something that we don't like to talk about in the church because we're all one family and oh my God, we love each other. And it's true, we are all one family and we do all love each other, but that doesn't mean that we all have the same amount of power. Yeah. Some people have a lot of power yeah. and can use that power to silence people who have a lot less power. And that's what we mean by gaslighting. Yeah. 
I think that, being mean to me on the internet, that's not gaslighting. Right, right. And I think that that has helped me define, you know, what do I think is the job description of a, of a survivor advocate? Yeah. And I think that there's, you know, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about this too, but I think that part of that job of being a survivor advocate is not having, not letting the survivors be the ones who are the only ones telling the story and the only ones enduring the exhaustion. Like it's almost the least we can do mm -hmm. to stand beside them while they rehearse the story again and again, yeah. or tell it, tell it ourselves when they run out of steam or when they can't keep up or. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we learned, that I learned being part of the Women and Gender Center at Manhattan College is that if a student comes to you, well, first of all, I'm a mandated reporter, so they can't really come to me unless they definitely want to escalate it forward. But we have peer advocates who at request the student's consent to record their story, um, to write it down, right? So that that way, the, the victim does not have to keep you know, going to interview after interview after interview to recount this, but they have a record that then the advocate can use and say, this is what this person reported to me, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. These are the you know, circumstances under which they were speaking and et cetera, et cetera, so that the, the survivor doesn't constantly have to be expending that energy. I mean, you can see why people never like, why, why don't people just report their sexual assault? Well, look what happens when you do. What's the incentive? Yep, exactly. When was the last time a woman who accused a powerful man of sexual assault won something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. Where is the incentive? And I think that's what we're seeing play out. A lot of this is on social media just because of the nature of us all being like stuck mm -hmm. at home and not having these conversations in person. So we're like seeing this all play out in writing. Yeah. <laughs> and that's so difficult, you know, and I don't want to discount that we're all cooped up and we all have a ton of anxiety because we are living through these apocalyptic times. And I feel like it makes, you know, our anger at injustice that much more intense because we feel the precarity of all of our lives like we're constantly feeling that our lives are in a precarious situation and so why would we want to spend time you know trying to get justice for victims <laughs> or why would we want to spend another moment in the situation of injustice when our time is so limited and and our time is so like i don't know it's just such an intense Thing. I do think that there's something to us all being home and all interacting only through our computers that exacerbates um, both our desire for justice, but also the reactionary, um, the pushback. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think that, you know, the a silver lining coming out of this is, you know, I heard you say earlier in your, in your talk too, that like we cannot look away from from injustices. We can't, as Christians, like, it's not, that's not our job. That's not what we're called to do. Like, oh, that's happening over there, but I'll just keep, it's nice and quiet over here. I'll just stay here. And I think maybe some of us for the first time are seeing it in a much more maximized way because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> exactly. We literally have nowhere to run away to. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Um, and nowhere to change the channel to. Yeah. So that's, that's hard. I think another thing that I'm seeing people, um, you know, react to or kind of receive as criticisms for some of the stuff that we're seeing played out is the critique of not liking the way that people say it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you might be true, that, that might be true, but could you say it a little nicer? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or could you say it? And I, I, I just, I want to bring that up here just because, um, you know, we had a good discussion yesterday in our preaching um, uh, webinar about discernment and about being able to prepare, um, you know, a reflection on the word of God in a way that people can hear it. However, I, I don't think that that's, you know, preaching is not the same thing right. as telling the story of your abuses <laughs> um, or the ways that you have been wronged. Right. And here again, we're, we're talking about the power differential. Right. Uh, this is something that uh, Brian Massingale, when he talks about racism and um, white supremacy, Everything always has to be framed around the comfort of the powerful. What if, and again, Christianity has a track record here in terms of Jesus, of reframing 
away from the comfort of the powerful and toward the comfort of the powerless. Mm -hmm. What if we did that mm -hmm. instead, right? Yeah, it's true. It's uncomfortable. Nobody likes to hear about sexual abuse. Nobody likes the feeling that it provokes in you, right? It is gross and betrayal, and it makes you feel very big, awful feelings. And it might remind you of your own trauma, or what's worse, it might remind you of shameful things that you've done, that you've never made amends for. And that self-revulsion really drives you outward. Okay, but remember that our comfort is not what's important, right? We don't always have to be like, if quarantine has taught me anything, living with a teenager and a tween, my comfort, turns out, is not paramount. Right? <laughs> my desire to do things, my desire for silence, my desire for whatever, is not the most important thing. The most important thing is survival. And if we look at it, like how, how long did survivors have to live with this? in that discomfort. I, I think about the, the survivors, especially from L'Arche of Vanier's abuse and how person after person and publication after publication was hailing this person as a living saint. And what does that do to a survivor? What about their comfort? Yeah. You know, like, can you say it a little more nicely, i.e. more truthfully? Yeah. So I hope that, that one of our takeaways from this is that we, we learn to sort of broaden the sorts of narratives that we are attentive to, and we pay particular attention to the narratives of powerless people. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't really know how to process the fact that in this particular situation, we're talking about someone who abused people who have been carrying that weight of abuse for longer than I've been on the planet. Yeah, I don't know what that is to carry that kind of grief for that long. Week in and week out, <laughs> yeah. right? Sunday yeah. in and Sunday out, funeral in and funeral out, wedding in and wedding out. Yeah, you know yeah. that's it's a it's, and it's not ask like what is the ask? Believe me, is the ask right? Believe what I'm saying is the ask. Yep. There's, that's a good, there's a question here too, like there's people who in response to hearing these claims are people who are, you know, calling for more action around the situation. Sometimes they're asked, well, what's the end game with all of this? And you're just trying to destroy him. You're just trying to bring him down. And I think that's the answer. Like, <laughs> just believe them. Like, just believe. Just believe people. Like, don't um, assume that women are devious. Like, don't make the assumption that women are lying. This, this freshman student I had, oh, anytime we talked about sexual assault, it was like, no, 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 but women are, li girls lie, girls lie. Yeah. Like, actually, girls don't lie about this. There's all kinds of research that shows that women don't lie about this. Yeah. You want to believe that because you don't want to believe how ubiquitous it is. Yeah. Right? And I don't want to believe it either, right? How can I send my kids to summer camp knowing the ubiquity of pedophilia? Right? How can I send my kids to college knowing the ubiquity of sexual assault? It's awful. It's this, this sinful structure in which we have to exist. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's what the gospel demands. Mm -hmm. right? The gospel demands yeah. that we pay attention to the people who've been wronged and to the people who are suffering, not mm -hmm. to the power. And I mean, this is, I don't know enough about the, the particular situation, but even in, in theological circles, right? When you have somebody who's hailed as this brilliant genius or whatever, like there was this guy in England who's like a biblical scholar or whatever. I don't know his name. I don't know his work and I don't care. But turns out he had like thousands and thousands and thousands of images of child pornography on his computer. And still, still people came forward and were like, but you can't just discount his work. And you're like, of course I can. Someone else can do it. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many women, how many scholars of color, how many, you know, up and coming young scholars have been silenced by people who, as it turns out, had thousands of images of child porn on their computer? Like, it's fine. We're going to get right through it. People will keep making music. People will keep writing theology. We're going to roll right on, right? Yeah. It's going to be fine. 
And it doesn't mean that we need to, you know, do violence, right? Physical violence is what I'm talking about here. Yeah. But it does mean, you know, that we can take a broader view and not limit, you know, or interrogate rather what we mean when we say genius. You know, what do we mean? Do we mean to pedestalize someone? Mm -hmm. The way that the Catholic Church did with priests for so long and look how that turned out, mm -hmm. right? An inability to fail, an inability to be perceived as someone who fails, right? That's a prison for everybody. So we need to be really cautious about that, about the way that we throw around genius, the way we yeah. throw around unique talent or unique gifts, right? And every profession does this, right? That's what happened with Matt Lauer. And he had like a button that he would use to lock the door of his office, like, like Dr. Mm -hmm. Evil, <laughs> like, literally like something out of Austin Powers. Oh my God. You know? So I'm glad, I'm glad that you, you clarified that too, that you're, because I was intrigued by the idea that a pedestal is a prison. Mm -hmm. And you mean that for everyone. Oh, yeah. Not, not yeah. for the one who is on the pedestal. It's, it's a prison for everyone. Yeah, that was the, the priest part that I took out. I'm, I'm writing this article right now, which we're hoping to place in a popular magazine with a, an old friend of mine. He went to school with my brother, um, who is a psychotherapist in, my, or in D.C. And he works with the archdiocese, both with incoming seminarians, but also with victims or survivors of abuse, and also with... Um, perpetrators. And he says, you know, one of the things that, that he finds most sort of galling is how little vocabulary there is around sexuality, desire, attraction, eros, whatever you want to call it, an inability to name those things, to name sexual desire for what it is, and just this caricatured idea of what it looks like, which sets people up to fail. Right. So he says a lot of the seminarians that come in to see him think that it's like Jessica Rabbit is going to show up outside their door and be like, va va voom or something. And that will be what causes them to break their vows. He's like, but none of them is thinking about the woman who brings you soup when you're sick. And that's where people run into trouble. Right. Yeah. Because they, they can't integrate the emotionality of sexual desire with the physicality of sexual desire. Yeah. Similarly, you have these priests who are on a pedestal who've done a bad thing. Right, which can be as simple as, you know, stepped out on their vow of celibacy with a consenting adult, who, because they are on this pedestal, feel like, well, I can never let anybody know what happened. And therefore, anyone whose sexual secret I know in this house or in this church, I will never be able to say anything because they might know and reveal my secret. Right? Once everyone is hiding a sexual secret and no one is allowed to make mistakes, then those pedestals become prisons again. Right? If there's nowhere that you can fail and nowhere that you can be your full authentic self, wait, what is the likelihood that you will be able to call somebody else out when they're failing? Yeah. And that's what we need, right? We, we need it to stop being, and you were alluding to this earlier, Kate, it has to stop being people with no power constantly pushing up against this pantheon of power, yeah, right? It has to be that the power collaborates or filters down or works as co-conspirators with people who have no power in order to hold each other to account, right? It's that, this way with race, it's this way with um, hierarchy, it's this way with everything. Like I remember when I was a young baby theologian and I had just moved to New York and I was talking to a priest, I don't even remember who it was, about something about feminism and it's, he's like you know it's just so great that you do this because you know the church really needs your voice and i can't say these things but i'm like you're the only one the church listens to bro mm -hmm. your caller not me mm -hmm. so if you who have all of the power can never say any of these things we're never gonna get anywhere yeah why can't you say these things because you don't want to jeopardize your shot at the bishop right you don't want to jeopardize your career he says, you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to. That's a really kind of dangerous moment. Yeah. Yes, Cecilia, I love her. She's also Cuban, by the way. I feel like that's really important to note. Also, <laughs> Tony Alonzo, Cuban. Yes, yeah, lots of Cubans here right now. Very Cubanified. <laughs> what can I say? A lot of energy there. <laughs> it's just, it's just so prophetic. And I, I have to say, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about the question of secrecy. Um, secrecy around the 
uh, just the hidden nature of sexuality, <laughs> whether it's, um, you know, in amongst the ordained or otherwise, but that's kind of the way that we treat we treat it in our church, right? And mm -hmm. to me, like secrecy, while I do think that there are some, some things in life that are meant to be held in confidence, mm -hmm. secrecy just feels so much like a lie. And it just feels like to me that it just erodes the human who holds it. Mm -hmm. And it makes me really distrust everything else <laughs> about the person, whether or not that's fair or not. But to have such a deep, thing to hide within you yeah um it just doesn't seem healthy to to me i think that a lot of what you're naming kate is is the relationship between secrecy and shame right the idea that if this secret gets out then i will feel shame or i will bring shame upon this person right that that we we hold things that we know are bad or whatever because of the shame attached to them. And in the particular case of sexuality, when literally only a tiny sliver of sexuality is the good kind and every single other part of the pie is sinful, then there's so much shame there that you'll never be able to say anything, which is why there's so much darkness right, and hiddenness about people's sexual lives. Um, when I talk about a sexuality or an ethics of concern, right, I really do think that, that sex ed and sex positive um, teaching is a communal good. It's not private, mm -hmm. right? Um, one of the things that feminism sort of gained in its first slash in the 1.5 wave, right, which we're celebrating right now, the ratification of the amendment that allowed some women to vote. This idea that, you know, women were allowed to live outside the home. And so all of the sort of private lives became private. But one of the things that became private in our private lives is our sex lives. But what, you know, and then you get, well, private lives, private parts, what goes on behind closed doors, you don't know what happens in someone else's marriage, et cetera. But that's where a lot of abuse flourishes, right? Mm -hmm. That's where so much abuse, not just sexual, but physical abuse flourishes in, in families behind closed doors, mm -hmm. in silence. So this idea of sex as a private matter, as just between a person and their partner, or just between a person and their spouse, actually distorts our idea of sexuality um, and our idea of what we think of when we think of the common good. It allows abuse to flourish and it's, it's dangerous. Yeah. Wow, I have never thought about that before. I know. A conversation about sexuality for the common good. We have to start doing it though, because it's yeah. not great. Yeah. And, it, and the, the thing is, is that when the church has no voice here, young people still seek out other voices. Yeah. Right? So you have like my students are really good at the legalistic framework. They're like, oh, well, you have to consent. What does consent mean? Well, they can rattle off like 10 things. This is what it means. And you have to do this and it has to be affirmative and blah, 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 blah. But like what that leads to is this kind of gross bare minimum sex, like legal sex, which I guess, you know, fine. But is that what we're aspiring to in relationships? Legality? Yeah. I mean, I guess on the one hand, yes. But on the other hand, like, don't you want more? Don't you want more for your kids? Don't yeah. you want more for your children, your friends, whatever, than just the bare minimum of what's legal? Yeah. You know, why can't the church elaborate something for that? Like not just allowable sex, but good sex. You know, what does that look like? What does mutual yeah. affirmation look like? What is, you know, a healthy sexual relationship through in all stages of life? What does that look like? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I'm just, I'm really like, this correlation between um, how how quickly someone who's been victimized or survived a sexual assault immediately feels like the sh the shamed one or the one who did something wrong, and I'm just I'm recalling too how many survivors have said to me, I I thought it was just me, and I didn't want to be the one to take him down. Right. That's and, the isolation and the privacy. Yeah. And I, what, what is, so many parts of this are just resonating with so much of our story. But I think especially that I wrote down this 
this quote, the unifying power of experience that prompts us to work for justice is what we're seeing in, in no one person taking him down, but we're seeing these people who are telling their truths and finding a solidarity in another person who had a truth and another person who had a truth and another person who had a truth. And they have built this grassroots kind of movement to say, mm -hmm. I don't have to be ashamed of this. Something bad happened to me. Right. I didn't invite it. Yeah. I didn't make a misstep. It's not because I wore that skirt that one day. It's not because I smiled at the wrong person. Like, this is how feminism has always worked, yeah. right? The idea that women were isolated, right, whether in their homes or out of the workplaces or whatever, or they had to feel grateful for even being there, right? meant that you never shared things that you didn't like because you were just so grateful to have a job that yeah. you never told yeah. anybody that the yes. boss would like pat you on the bottom every yeah. single time yeah you, know, you didn't want to be the one to shake the boat or whatever yep and then once people you hear each other's stories you're like hang on a second right this isn't something that i brought on myself i've been walking around with this cross right thinking that 18 year old me made a mistake. Yeah, yes. That has then caused, right? How many mistakes did we make when we were 18? Too many, too many yeah. to count, right? And the idea that, that you would have to carry that around is because of that, I'm carrying around this ugliness and this is my fault. When in fact, that was the thing that got me about the NCR piece. He mem the three survivors share that he memorized their 18th birthdays. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Come yeah. on, that's a pattern. And I think a lot of the a lot of the women that I've spoken to, at least, have have felt coerced into it because of some type of career advancement or opportunity, whether it be to be involved in a liturgy or to um, you know get a, get a song published maybe someday or right. um, power differential to be in a recording studio. Yeah. Um, and I think that it left a lot of people thinking, well, I did want that advancement. And so maybe I was okay with it. Right. <laughs> yeah. This is just the game that you have yep. to play. Yep. And therefore, right. But, but we can write the rules of the game. Like, yeah. The rules of the game are not in scripture. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we can <laughs> rewrite the rules of the game, right? Yeah. As it turns out, there are more than one ways to play. Yeah. So why not, why not try something different? Um, and I, I mean, I don't know that I have the prescriptive answer, right? This is what we need to do more. I don't know, you know, but I know that the first step is to believe women. And the second step is to allow women to tell their stories. And the third step is to hold people who are predators accountable. And then from there, we can probably start figuring out the rest of it. I have like a thousand more questions. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewatch this when it airs. Um, I, I think if we did it like uh, yesterday's, it'll probably be like 10 a.m. Central time tomorrow. And I'm just gonna highlight the things that come as questions to me in the comments of that premiere video. Um, but I need to thank you again immensely for your scholarship on this and for just looking us all in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and saying, let's talk about this let's do this together um thank you so very much we're going to post uh, um all of the the resources that you mentioned the books and um the uh uh any other artists or uh, poets or writers that you'd like to mention we'll be happy to follow up with their information in the follow-up email cool. thank you all for joining us today i was so so grateful that we were having this conversation and the thank yous are, are pouring in now. Well, thank um, you so much. This was a real, you know, honor for me. And I'm sorry that this is the crucible that had to bring us together. But at the same time, uh, I'm happy to, if people want to reach out to me personally, I'm happy to, you know, chat. I'm always available on Twitter and whatever. Um, if you are on here and I've never met you and you sent me a Facebook thing, I probably won't say yes because I do put pictures of my kids on there. <laughs> um, but I'm super wide open on Facebook. On, uh, Twitter. Twitter, so go nuts. Yeah. And you can always send me an email. I'm very responsive there as well. on fire on Twitter. <laughs> Follow this woman on Twitter. All right, well, before okay. we run out of Zoom time, thank you one more time. And thank you all. Thank you. Uh, we'll see you for the rest of the series.
All right. Bye.